<laughs> Alright, so we got three TV shows to talk about this week. I originally thought it would only be two, but a new show came back. And I almost forgot that it was coming back. Thankfully, my DVR has a better memory than I do. So, first, let's talk about The Walking Dead. Episode was called Forget. And at the beginning of the episode, we see that Rick, Carol, and Daryl have a plan, or they're forming a plan to steal their weapons, or at least steal some of their weapons back so that they can be prepared, so that they have an edge against this town in case something bad goes wrong. And I get that, especially everything that they've been through. Could you blame them? Woodbury, Terminus, even losing their own prison. Of course, they're going to be weary of these people. Uh, and then, though, we see this walker come out of nowhere. And unlike when, when, when it was just Rick and Carl, this walker had a W carved on its forehead. And I, I didn't know what that was or what that meant. I looked up online. And I didn't want to read too much into it. I didn't want to like get it spoiled because I guess it is something from the comic books that there's uh, wolves group or gang that this could be referring to building up something that's going to be if it is what I think it is it's going to be pretty intense um, seeing Daryl and Aaron who Aaron was clearly following Daryl out into the woods because he was hunting rabbits right well uh, they had a nice conversation and Aaron basically worked his magic and tried to get Daryl to at least open up more about the town and go to the party that they were hosting and Daryl it kind of worked uh, not only did he go or at least he tried to go but while they were out uh, they saw this horse that they wanted to try to help out because it's been out there by itself and they wanted to sort of just round him up until these walkers came and the horse got eaten pretty bad and I felt bad. Look, I, I'm not like an animal lover or anything like that. I don't dislike them, but it's just, you know, you're not going to see me going around uh, spitting all of this stuff about how we need to save the animals. I just, I felt bad seeing that happen to the horse. It, it was, you know, in this world especially, seeing animals who, it's not like they can comprehend what's going on. They're scared. They're terrified. This horse looked terrified. And... Of course, in the very first episode, we did see a horse get eaten as well. But you almost forget that walkers are willing to eat animals because you don't see it as much. You see it here and there, but I'm so used to them going after people. I also wondered, though, like, if like, what would happen if, say, the horse got bit and then but didn't get like devoured like that, or if Aaron didn't shoot the horse, would the horse come back as a zombie? Probably not, because it's not as much of an infection it's more of when you just die you come back and if they hunt animals then I guess the animals don't die when Daryl shoots them with an arrow so I guess animals aren't susceptible to whatever this zombie thing is which is weird but let's talk about the party because this was weird and it was supposed to be weird right here we have our group who for the last two years in their timeline have been out there during the apocalypse fighting for their lives killing when they had to and just being almost cavemen like now they're in this town and these people a lot of these people don't seem like they know how awful it is out there how terrible it is maybe they were out there for a few weeks a couple of months but they they forgot how shitty it is and they're living like it's a regular society like it's a normal cocktail party and they're enjoying themselves conversating it was weird it was eerie as simple as it was it was weird and seeing the group not being able to deal with it Sasha even freaked out and she was to one of the ladies like that's what you're worried about whether or not she would cook the wrong food that she didn't like, like and Sasha having all the flashes of just everything she's been through, her brother dying, this person dying, that person dying. Of course, you understand and you feel bad for 
you at least understand where like Sasha's coming from, Rick and Carol. But then Carol, who her plan was to unlock the window and then climb back in there later to steal the guns. Now this other little kid who I guess wanted Carol to bake him some cookies, go figure. He followed her and saw this. And Carol, I didn't know what she was going to do. <laughs> there was a tiny part of me that said, is she going to fucking kill this kid right now? Just kill him? And say, I don't know, he ran away. Well, she might have done something worse. She put the fear of killing him in him. She basically said, if you tell anyone that what you've seen, what you seeing me do this, I'm going to take you out into the night, out of this walls, tie you up to a tree, and basically your screaming and crying will lure walkers to come and eat you alive. Fuck! And for a second I was surprised that Carol was doing that until you have to stop and think, wait a minute, Carol is the same person who burnt Tyrese's girlfriend and that other kid alive to make sure the group was safe. So to say that Carol is willing to say and do anything to keep her group safe and ensure their protection, their safety, is a bit of an understatement. Uh, it's almost funny, though, to think that, like, say if this show somehow, if, this peop if the people in the town were the main characters and then Rick's group shows up and seeing the way how they're treating the townspeople, Rick's group would be the villains. They would be like the crazy, scary people. So to see that dynamic, to see our main characters become what they've become, they spent too much time out there in the wild in this apocalypse, and, and they can't settle back into society. They can't. It's almost like they have PTSD, you know? They just they can't deal with it. Rick, who at the party had almost... Uh, kissing session with Jesse. It's a little too close there, but he kissed her on the cheek. And then the last scene was Rick and he saw Jesse and her husband. And he he put his hand back to his back and made it seem like he was this close to just shooting the fucking guy and saying, fuck this. Shooting you and I'm taking your girl. Like <laughs> Rick I don't know, you know, you, you kind of like Rick like this, just the edginess and the whole shoot first, ask questions later. I mean, he's definitely group first and everyone else second. I like that quality about him. But it was a little scary, right? I mean, sure, he might have a thing for this Jesse girl, but she's married. She has kids with this guy. You can't just kill him because he might be a prick or he might be an asshole. Who really knows? He might feel threatened by Rick, so maybe that's why he's acting this way. It's, it's very weird, especially where at the end of the episode, Rick hears the walker outside of the wall, and it's almost like hearing that walker made him feel more comfortable than how he was feeling with these people. I'm fascinated seeing this group and how each and every one of them are dealing differently in this town. I'm sure some people are going to say, oh, no one's died, or oh, there's not as much action. Who cares? This, this is character stuff. This is psychological. This is great storytelling in a different way, and I appreciate the show doing that. Now let's talk about the TV show that came back. Bates Motel. Wow, huh? Season 3. The episode was entitled A Death in the Family. And, okay, where do we start? The beginning, you see Norman and Norma cuddling. Mother and son, just in bed, cuddling. Like, I mean, fuck. And I know it's not like I'm projecting incest. No, that's what is going on here. It's, it's, it's at least implied that something is up. It's almost like the, they're in denial. They won't admit it, but it's there. I even love Dylan's reaction when he was trying to wake Norman up and he saw that and was just like, fuck. I mean, he didn't make a big deal out of it, but he was just like, okay, that's my mom and that's my brother. That's the fucking family I have. Wow. And then he laughed. He's like, I'm not fucking dealing with this. It's weird. And uh, Norma finds out that her mother died 
which her reaction at the beginning was a little weird. She was like, I don't give a shit. I don't care. And I liked, though, that later on she did break down. She cried. She showed some emotion about it. She even said, I don't know why I'm upset because I haven't talked to her in like 20 years. But still, it's, it's her mom. And she's probably more upset that she didn't have a mom in her life. And maybe that has something to do with why she is so close to Norman or feels so close to him. Norman is still screwed up from not only last season and finding out about the blackouts and not being able to control that, but he is feeling bad about killing his teacher, Miss Watson, who he like hallucinates her right there in the lunchroom with him, which is kind of creepy, imagining her neck slit. And he just runs home in the rain. He ran all the way home. Wow. And so I guess his next thing is to be homeschooled. Norma is willing to do that, okay? I mean, it does make sense, actually. Seeing Norman in a regular high school interacting with high school kids was always kind of weird in the first place for me. So him being homeschooled just makes perfect sense. It's a little too late. I mean, he's, he's already 18 and about to be done with high school. But still, it's going to happen. Even Emma, he, I guess Emma is going to be homeschooled with them, which is kind of interesting and weird. I should mention this right now with Emma. Uh, so Norman asks her out, like, to date. And she says yes. That was a little random and completely caught me by surprise. I mean, yeah, I know that she's like Norman for a while, but Norman seemed either oblivious by it or didn't care because Bradley was there. I guess now that Bradley's gone, though, oh, okay, oh yeah, Emma's here. Emma's cute. I I do like her. I I felt a little bad, though, when it's like, okay, they just started going out, like, that day. And then what do you know? This hot chick shows up at the, at the motel, and she's there. She's there, and she spends some time with Norman. She's insanely hot, like I said. And then later on, he's even quick to get up and drive her to wherever she had to go. I guess she's an escort, and she didn't know where the place was. Norman was willing to drive her. And even though that was all weird, and I was just, I was mostly hoping that he wouldn't, like, sleep with this chick. But then the way how the episode ended with him driving her car back, even when he, he told her not to turn, where I'm pretty sure she was supposed to, did he kill her? Uh, okay, I mean, maybe he did, and if he did kill her, then he's racking up his, his kills. And it seems like killing women is going to be his thing because he tried to kill his, his uncle last season. That didn't really go well. Speaking of his uncle, so the uncle comes back to try to talk to Dylan because he knows that he's his father. Yes, Dylan's uncle is also his father. That's not weird. And I like Dylan's reaction of just saying, like, look, I, I don't want anything to do with you. Just just get out. But it's he also feels bad. And I know that, that his his uncle father tried to explain things. And, and, like, okay, maybe he's not a total asshole or deadbeat or scumbag like I originally thought. But still, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how he's going to keep it a secret that he's there. Because Norma clearly wants nothing to do with him. I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. Um, but yeah, I, I thought the episode was good. Uh, I, I like Bates Motel. I might, I might have some weird complaints or nitpicky things. I don't care that the show is in our current time. When I think of Norman Bates and I think of Psycho, I think of 1960s. So that still I'm trying to get over. But besides that, I love Vera Flaminga. She's the best thing about the show. Uh, and, and as weird as it is for Norman to be cuddling with his mom, she's pretty hot. <laughs> she's smoking hot. I don't know. I'm not saying if she was my mom, uh, but fuck. All right. Let's talk about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode was entitled, Who You Really Are. We see the very first scene is May training with Sky, which I liked. I like seeing Sky learn fighting skills. I mean, I know she's pretty much had that down since the beginning of the season. But still, it was nice to see it. And Fitz even shows up when he thinks maybe May is being a hard on Sky. He doesn't want Sky to, like, freak out and earthquake everything. 
And when I said last week I didn't really understand why Fitz was keeping her secret for her, I, I, I saw people online talk about how, well, it's more because since Fitz's accident and he's basically brain damaged and people now look at him weird and differently and think that he's now off, he relates to Sky, or he at least feels bad for her. He knows what it's like to be looked at that way. And even though Sky is uh, almost a more serious situation, he still feels bad for her. And he still doesn't think it's right for the whole group to turn on her just because she's different. I like how he said, you're just different now. You know, you're not evil. You're not dangerous. You're not anything. You're just different. So I like that. I like Fitz a lot more for trying to help Sky. And then we see Coulson wants Mac on the field, which makes complete sense. You look at Mac, he's huge. He's a brick house. I, I, I don't know why he wasn't on the field beforehand. He even tried to say, oh, uh, violence isn't my thing. I'm like, dude, violence isn't your thing. You're a brick shit house. Come on. And then we see that Bobby is sleeping with Hunter, which I shouldn't be surprised. I'm pretty sure we've seen them hook up before. But it wasn't just like a hookup, like they're actually almost rekindling their relationship. And between her and Mac and their secret, whatever they're doing, they had a scene where they talked about it and she had to come to an agreement where she's going to push Hunter away for his sake. And they said they're not Hydra. Okay, I appreciate us getting that. But we still don't know. Maybe it's one secret at a time. We did get a secret re revealed a lot earlier than I thought we were going to get it. Even though we knew about it. The group found out about it. Before I get to there, though, I want to I mention Sif, who was basically the main plot of the episode. Sif is back on Earth, and I guess she was undercover, going after a Kree, uh, trying to figure out what he was doing on Earth. But she has no memory. You find out that the Kree has this weapon that can take away people's memories. And I thought it was a little weird, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love seeing Sif, especially on this show. She gets she doesn't get enough time, enough development in the Thor movies, which is weird to say. But when she shows up on here, she gets stuff to do. And even here, even though we didn't see her with her memory, so she wasn't quite the Sif that we know and love, she didn't have her armor, uh, she still provided some funny moments, her not knowing things and like trying to still look tough and act tough but not being sure if she's saying the right things, all of that I loved, I even love every time she says to Coulson, son of coal, like <laughs> it's simple but it, it made me laugh the first time and it still makes me laugh every time she says it, I love Jamie Alexandra who is the actress that plays her. I like that she's doing a TV show, even though she did the movies. Very cool. Now, this Kree, I thought at first it was a frost giant, because frost giants at least could make their skin look human. I mean, Loki is technically a frost giant, right? But no, they established that it is a Kree, and he's using helium or something to make him look human. Okay. All right, and then apparently he's not like evil. He's trying to find out what happened, basically. The Kree technology that turned Reyna and Sky into what they are in humans. He's trying to put an end to all of that, get rid of them. And so this is how we find out or how the group finds out what Sky is. I love that. As much as I like what Fitz is doing for Sky, I didn't like that the group didn't know about it. I think there was too many lies going on in the group. How many times in this episode alone did people have to have conversations behind other people's back? You don't really want to see that in a group. So I like that this was only one episode. They quickly find out. I mean, how do you keep that a secret? Every time Sky gets nervous or, or mad or afraid, the room shakes. I love the effect when the glass broke behind her and she's freaking out, she can't control it. I even love that Coulson's first reaction was to protect her. So again, it's like, well, you didn't really need to keep it a secret, did you? Because look at Coulson, his first reaction is to protect her, to not let Sif take her away and experiment on her. So the, at least, well, I shouldn't say most of the group because at the end we see a whole big debate 
with everyone where some people mostly Fitz is like no she's still Sky we still have to protect her she's our friend but everyone else was like no she's dangerous we have to do something we have to lock her up something something of course Sky saw that I did feel bad for Fitz because I'm like hey come on Sky at least tell Fitz thank you for defending me in front of everyone he was like one against seven uh, but, you know, what does what does Sky do at this point? She feels like she's endangered. But, I don't know. I, I did like the episode a lot. Uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been really good lately. It's, it's so far, so good. I love the Inhuman stuff. Especially the previews to next week. But I do have some questions. Especially with Sif's involvement in this episode. Is Loki Odin... Because at the end of Thor 2, we saw Odin let Thor leave Asgard to be on Earth, and then he transformed into Loki. Loki was making an illusion. And it looks like Loki is pretending to be the king of Asgard. Is that still the case? Because Sif says that Odin had me go to Earth to go after this Kree. So is Loki, did Loki have her do that? As Odin, I don't know, I, I obviously think about stuff like that, and this is, I guess this could be a complaint about the show, is that, am I watching this show, but does it really not have anything to do with the movies? I mean, yeah, it's connected, yeah, it's the same universe, but is anything that the show is doing, is it really going to affect the movies, or is, it, is this ever going to be mentioned in the movies? Who really knows? Where's Thor? I know Thor is on Earth. He's, I guess, having a relationship with Jane Foster, which is fine. But, so is he not doing anything? Is he, like, living a normal life? Did he get a job? Does he not know if there's a Kree on Earth or if there's any type of mayhem going on? Does he not do anything? It's weird, right? He doesn't know that Sif is showing up undercover. Does Sif not ever want to go look for Thor and say, what the fuck, you left? That's a little weird. Uh, does Coulson know anything about what the Avengers are doing? Because I know the Avengers technically don't know that Coulson is still alive. I'm pretty sure they don't know. But Coulson, was, he had that interaction with Fury. And Fury made him director. But Fury's still going to be doing Avengers things, according to the trailer of the new movie so like it seems like nobody knows what each other is doing last question is where's ward now i know this is most likely to be answered soon but still i want to know what he's doing he's such a big part of especially sky now that sky is different what's what's his connection to that what does he think of that i don't know just some stuff to think about because I overthink everything. Anyways guys, let me know in the comments below what do you think of any one of these shows. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Later.